So, Megan, today we have a real treat. We do. We don't typically get to, I mean, we know some of the people we interview via online or we meet them at a race and talk to them for a few minutes. But today we have a special guest. Yes. And we know him quite well. He runs with us sometimes. Runs He's, in front of me, mostly. Yeah. In Baltimore. Who That's it? That I mean, okay, I'll give it better than that. <laughs> Jeremy it not only runs with the Fast Ambassadors and runs here in Baltimore, but he is a hell of a runner and won the Baltimore Marathon, not once, but twice, three times. I don't know how many times, all the time. Anytime he signs up for it, he pretty <laughs> much wins, except for his first time. But um, yeah, I mean, you're pretty much as elite as Baltimore gets. Would you say so? Uh, yeah, I would say so. But that's, I guess, more of a commentary on Baltimore than me in some respects. But yeah, well, we'll get into that. Yeah. I think it's respectable. Yeah, maybe there's not as many people as maybe Boulder, Colorado, or Flagstaff, or some of the other running meccas. But here in Baltimore, and the fact is, you have a job here in Baltimore. So it's not like you can go out there and uh, be training with the Molly Seidels and the rest of the crew out, out in Flagstaff. So let's get into it. Um, I'd like to start because I think there's some stuff we could learn about Jeremy that we don't know. And yeah, so we should also preface this with Jeremy just ran the Houston Marathon, uh, did a 222? 242. 220, 242. 42. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's not even a 22 in there. It's a 220, 42. 42. How fast did Kira do it in? Uh, 219.12. So you were near her uh, at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw she was you on TV. Me with they her. <laughs> she was near me, and then she was well beyond me. I mean, yeah. she said one of her favorite things was saying hi to you on the course. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, I believe it. Yeah. Like, it totally dwarfed the uh, American record. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I know that guy. Um, no, but uh, seriously, let's start at the beginning because one of my favorite things about you is your first marathon was. How do you say it in French? Shit show. <laughs> um, why don't you? Why don't you start running? And what happened? Like, how did you get into running in the first place? Yeah. So I mean that that goes back uh, a long time. When I was eight or nine, my dad got me into running. So we'd go to the local track or the local trail and go for a run once or twice a week. So something that me and my brother uh, hated quite a bit <laughs> when he made us do it. And then uh, after a certain amount of time, I started to enjoy it. My brother, I don't think that ever really happened. So he switched to, uh, you know, other sports, et cetera. But I started enjoying it. I did some 5Ks and 10Ks as a, a kid. And Were you successful? I did okay. I mean, I think when I actually looked back semi-recently, and when I was nine, I ran like a 27, 28-minute 5K. So pretty good for a, a kid, yeah. I guess. And With then, little uh, legs, tiny little legs. Yeah. What, what happened... Like what changed from you not liking the running to enjoying it? Because normally it's like you have super success and then kids are like, I got attention. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly what shifted. I mean, it wasn't like I just loved it all the time yeah. when that happened, but it was just sort of maybe got a little more used to it. Maybe, I, I don't know, it's just yeah. uh, doing it repetitively. It, it felt a little better. Maybe it's hard to recall. But anyway, then I, I ran cross country in middle school along with playing soccer on the team there and then in high school i ran cross country and track where was this where did you grow up in silver spring Maryland. okay so i i was going through a pretty classic i guess running build up as a kid you know ran in middle school and high school but then had a couple semi not major but semi major injuries that pushed me away a bit i mean in my first year of college i like ran with the club team a couple times a week and did like the Richmond half marathon and ran, I think it was a 129. So pretty good for not running a ton, but I, I had this femoral neck stress fracture that really wow. kept me out for, I don't know how long, at least half a year. How do you get a femoral neck fracture? Uh, just a stress fracture from running overuse. I really? Mean, yeah, I mean, I didn't even think that was pop in your neck. Uh, like femoral neck, so in the oh. uh, upper <laughs> upper part of your femur. Yeah. That's just how much about anatomy yeah. I know. I'm like so, thinking, how, how's your head get a... Yeah, it's basically the, the top part of the femur. You ah, okay. can get a stress fracture, and if it worsens, can become a full fracture. It would be far worse. So I had that and a couple stress fractures in my foot all within two or three years. So at that point, I just sort of said, Pulled like, forget head. this. You know, like, I don't know. 
I mean, I still played soccer and stuff at, in college, like on like intramural teams and even in the later years would run with a friend like once a week or something, but nothing crazy. So something happens and you decide you're going to run a marathon. Is that like, yeah, it was it? like, uh, I came to Baltimore in fall of 2015 after college for graduate school. And where the, were you going to graduate school? Uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore at the hospital here. So I started that, and they had a, a relay team for the program. So I did that my first year, and it was pretty fun, like doing the, I think it was a six-mile leg. I had the last leg of the marathon, so it's mostly downhill. You get to run through the exciting part, so yeah, that was great. That's <laughs> a high, high point. Yeah. I, th I think you still, do you still get the the Lake Montebello part for the sixth leg? You do. You the... start at uh, Clifton Park. So yeah. you still get, you still have to climb some hills. Yeah, you get one hill. Yeah. yeah one hill in there. Yeah. And then, uh, so basically... I think it was 2017, the fall there, I signed up for the marathon. I'm going to train for a marathon. I'm going to do it. You know, it's one of those bucket list things. Didn't really train a lot, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Probably ran uh, once a week on average. And Would you, Did you not train a lot because you were cocky and like, I can do this? Or did you not train a lot because, hey, I'm busy. I'm in grad school. I got a lot going on. I s committed to it. I'm going to show up. It was probably a, a combination, a little cockiness, like, oh, like, you know, I'm trying to run like eight something minute pace. That shouldn't be that hard. Like I've run, you know, obviously, okay. Time in the half years ago. And also I think just a, a complete lack of motivation. It wasn't, you know, very important to me to train or succeed you're at in that point. Pretty good physical shape right now. Were, were, were you in good physical shape then? I was in decent shape. I mean, I was still playing sports with friends doing like rec leagues and stuff. So it's not like I was out of shape, but I wasn't, you know, in good running shape, I would yeah. say. So I, I was probably doing my, you know, one run a week. And I said, Oh, I need to do some long runs. So I think I did one 13 miler. I did one 16 miler. And then I did one 20 miler. Those are my one run of the week, you know, <laughs> building up. And I did the 20 miler at like eight something minute pace. So I was like, Oh, okay. I'm ready to run three thirty. That's a good goal. Like let's do it. And then it just uh, obviously did not pan out that way in the race. Yeah, so just, what, uh, what happened in the race? And this is your first race is Baltimore Marathon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which which we've said on the show before, not the easiest course. Now, we love it because it's our hometown race. But it has, I mean, this is a tricky race. It's a tough. We were it's talking about course. We were yeah. talking about elevation. And it's not that it has a huge amount of elevation, but it's where the elevation is. And the short period of time that you hit that elevation. So it's basically running up towards Hopkins, then running up through Clifton Park, and then you get around the lake, Montebello, yep. and then it's like a, a drag of a hill on, what is that, 32nd Street? Yeah, up on uh, Hill and 33rd mm. there, yeah. It, it just grinds you on the marathon, and nobody gets to miss it. We talked about the half marathon gets it, and the full marathon gets it. The full marathon's getting it around mile 20. Yeah. So it hurts. So, yeah, there's those two big climbs. You have the first three or four miles are straight up a big hill. And you get to go down that big hill and get pretty excited, especially in that first yeah. half of a race. So, Which, that was the moment where I abandoned the 330 pacing group because it felt so good. Like, why am I going this <laughs> slow at mile five? See, this is how you know it's my first marathon. Uh. I was like, man, this feels really easy. Like, why am I staying back here with these guys? So I, <laughs> Losers. I fly down, you know, I think it was... What street does it get on? St. Paul or something? Yeah. And flying down that hill, and I catch up to the 315 group by the harbor. Oof. So I'm running with them through like the halfway point and a little further, and then just hits me real hard on that uh, long climb from about mile to 15 to 19, basically yeah. that steady climb. Just uh, someone, it feel like someone hands you a bag of groceries or yeah, something. Yeah, just my legs were like, nah, this this isn't happening anymore. Like you really made a huge mistake here. <laughs> also first marathon, are you hydrating and taking in nutrition? Uh, trying to remember if I even had gels. I feel like I didn't because I, <laughs> yes. I well, they do have it on course. Yeah, yeah but definitely I might've taken one gel at the Under Armour HQ. I remember because they, ha I remember a station there having them. So I think I took one gel. Yeah. Okay. So that's around mile. That's I like, want to say that's like seven or eight. Yeah. It's somewhere. Yeah. Eight to 10 ish. I yeah. Think, yeah. So okay. I took that gel and then hundred calories <laughs> feeling, feeling terrible. I have no idea about yeah. running nutrition. That's not a thing in the yeah. 5k or 10k. Right. You know, it's just, so I, I felt awful and I'm walking, I'm cramping, I'm trying to jog. So I eventually make my way to Lake Montebello to an aid station. 
like, hey, can I drop out? You know, I'm not going to finish this. They're like, yeah, like, come into the AIDS, have, have some chips for electrolytes that'll help your cramps. I'm like, okay, sure. It's like, uh, the sweeper car will be here in, like, 90 minutes or oh, two hours. No. I was like, oh, well, forget that. I can like, walk back. Yeah, I was like, I might as well <laughs> keep going if it's that long. So I just eventually make my way through the rest of the course, uh, limp walking, jogging every once in a while. And I think the, the back half took about three hours or so oh. to, to come in at oh. about 4.45 there. Oh. So it was uh, pretty brutal. And I remember it was pretty much pure agony even walking because I had such awful cramps, like just yeah. really painful. Lactic yeah. acid. I, yeah. Yeah, I get it. The Now, most people, if this happens to them, one of two things happen. They never run a marathon again. But knowing Jeremy, he's like a student. He's going to figure this out and come back for revenge. Is that pretty much what happened? Pretty much. I was like, wow, that's, that's a, no offense. I mean, for me, it was, I guess, a bad time compared to my previous Well, you're comparing, yeah, you're comparing it to, uh, how old are you at the time, in 2017? Uh, 24? You're 24 so. years old. Yeah. Running's been part of your life, ran cross country. You're used to a little bit of, a, uh, you, like when you were saying earlier, for you, a 3.30, an eight-minute pace, would have been like you thought yeah. an easy day. Yeah. So to come in at 445 an hour and 15 minutes longer than maybe where you had perceived in your mind, that would be a slow race in, in that. In yeah. That, in and that. especially, I guess just the, the pure agony that unfolded yeah. throughout. Yeah. So I think that just, that lit a big fire under me. I was like, okay, like going to do this right and do one properly this time and see what I can actually do. So and how was, long did it take you to reload? I did one the next March, so that's I guess five months later. Was it the DC? It it's called the Lower Potomac River Marathon. It's in like Southern Maryland. It's like a small one or two hundred person race. Oh, I wow. think it actually got uh, it no longer exists as of a couple of years ago, which is a shame. It's a pretty fun race down there. It's on these like you know very flat Southern Maryland roads by the water and. So I, I properly trained that time. I ran, you know, 40 miles a week. I did a long run every week. No real workouts, but I was, you know, getting way more mileage and, and long runs. And it paid off big time because I, I was going to go for 315. And then first mile, I get excited. I'm right behind this <laughs> other guy who's there. He's running like 640, 650. I was like, this seems like a bad idea, but there's no one else even close by. So I might as well just do this. And basically ran behind. He's He's a local runner here in Montgomery County, Aaron Kelman, and I had met him that day. I basically just was drafting off this guy, which I didn't realize at the time is awful etiquette. I did none, <laughs> of, none of the leading. I was just behind him the whole way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I ended up running three flats. I was like, wow, that's that's a really so significant... So you didn't, you didn't pass him at the end? I did, actually. We okay. were coming so in around mile 23, and he was like, this... He's like, I'm starting to lose it. You know, I don't think we're going to get sub three anymore. If you want to go, you got to go now. And at first I was like, no, I'll finish with you. It's like, actually, I feel pretty good. I'll go for this. <laughs> so I took off. And so you just drafted behind him for 23 miles and then we're like, peace. Yeah, was pretty there, much. Was, <laughs> you said it was a small race. Did you end up winning this race? I ended up getting, I think it was fourth or fifth. So went from, you know, 445 where there's still people behind you, but for runners, there's not too many runners behind you. It's more run walkers and and maybe people who are, are more of a, a different style of pace or running. And then you go and you come in fourth place. And I mean, it did this now ignite something inside of you? Like, what did you feel like after you, after you did that? Yeah, so that I think, you know, it's just that positive, you know, reinforcement. It's a big affirmation. It's like, wow, I trained significantly harder at the time it felt you know very hard to train like that and yeah 40 miles to you now a week would be you're injured <laughs> yeah so i mean it was coming from you know 10 or less yeah. miles a week probably so it was a big jump and i remember during that that training cycle i was thinking 315 as a goal and i was thinking maybe i would learned about boston qualifying i really hadn't known about it until that training cycle it's like maybe by the end of the year in the fall i could go for a boston qualifier and I found out that it was 305 at the time. I'd gotten it, applied to Boston, but then there was that, it was that five minute mm -hmm. extra year. So I missed it by 40 seconds or something. Uh. But uh, so that was a big motivation. I was like lifting a lot more at the time, like five times a week. I was 
trying to do this whole, like, I want to bench squat and deadlift a total of a thousand pounds and run a BQ because then I'll be the, the ideal athlete that's <laughs> in my head, but you know, it'd be this perfectly balanced strength and speed combo. So that was, that was a big motivation at the time, obviously not, not so much on the strength side anymore. But. So it's surprising to me that like 2018 is, is would have been that March. Cause you did 2017, the first one. Yeah. I feel like I've been running with you for a, at least that long. And I, I don't remember you not being the beast that you are. Yeah, so I I started running with the Faster Bastards, I think it was June of 2018. Doing the Wednesday night run. The Wednesday night run. I heard, hey, there's this new fast guy that's like kind of crushing everybody. And so this is when you're doing all this weightlifting? I was doing a lot of weightlifting until it was around June or July that I kind of tempered it down because I was like, wait. I can do both, but I'm not going to be as successful at running if I continue to lift weights, you know, five times a week for yeah. an hour or whatever. And it's clearly impacting it. And not just lifting weights, running. I mean, if he was running 40 miles, lifting weights, and undergrad, it's not undergrad. What what do you call it? Like, oh, like a PhD student. PhD yeah. student. Um, see, I know, not, like, femoral neck. <laughs> <laughs> PhD student. Um, you're, you're also in a very demanding education like set up at the time or regiment. So it, I, I think that's what I've always like, you look at someone and we talk about Kira D'Amato or some of these people that have like a life outside of running. It's not like you're sitting there training and that's all you have, but you throw up 80, hundred mile weeks while you're in school. You just started your full-time job. You took a job and you can like, I don't want to butcher what you do now. I know it has something to do with, like the uh, don't even try. <laughs> I, I want to say with the uh, contagious stuff that's going around. Yeah. So I'll let you describe that. But so what what are you doing now with your job? Uh, so I finished my PhD summer 2020, about I guess half a year into this pandemic, and then I continued in a postdoc uh, researcher position for one year in the lab I had done my PhD in, where I was studying a uh, whooping cough is a bacterial disease then i made the switch over this past summer to this this new lab at university of maryland where we research coronavirus biology uh, vaccines potential drugs and therapeutics so those are the main uh focuses of my current job uh, especially the the therapeutic side these days so not a job that you can sit and play sudoku while while you're at work right it's yeah like so a... it's it's definitely changed things a bit for me with training i mean i have to work in like a biosafety lab where you're you know have a respirator and a suit and when you're in there for hours it can obviously you're not drinking water you know oh, so, it's, so especially in the summer it was it was a bit of a challenge with workouts and stuff where i'd have to do that either before that and feel pretty bad up there or do it after work you know yeah wait so how long are you are you in that suit and like eight hours? Uh, not eight hours. No, that would be. Okay. Nuts. Yeah. Um, on any given day, it's anywhere from one hour to on bigger days, like five-ish hours. Oh. But you work an eight-hour day. Yeah. Yeah. It, depending. I mean, eight, eight-ish, ten-ish. It's, yeah. it's largely flexible around experiments, luckily. What so. I'm trying to get at is, you know, uh, I'm going to take them back in time here in a, in a second, but I, I want people to understand you're, you have a full-time job, and it's not an easy job like where you get to sit and relax and maybe recover. You're on your feet. You're doing stuff. It's mentally tasking, I'm sure. Um, and then you're putting together 100-mile weeks and training for, for goals like this. But when when you came out, I think the time that I felt like most – proud of you and also like was like ah oh, jeremy's our baltimore guy was the first time you ran the ball but when you won the baltimore marathon and i think the reason it was so important not just for you like it was great that you won it <laughs> <laughs> wow it's so great for everybody else is it really like all the people that run with you that aren't don't have the talent that you have that aren't as fast as you one of ours kind of showed up and kicked butt and we were like hey that's our guy that's that's he wears the jersey i wear like and i i remember that day and i just remember the elation on every single person that we knew and even people that don't run in the group were excited for you like 
other running groups in town were like, that's the guy. Like, look what he just did. And I think that it was emotionally, that's a day I will never forget. And it had nothing to do with me. Yeah, I mean, 100% agreed, obviously, for me. Yeah, that yeah. was a, a big day, yeah. So what was, so you run the three hours. Was Baltimore wasn't your next. Baltimore was my next, but oh. that year I got third in 240. So that was a year before I won. Okay. Yeah, so I, I ran 240 that fall at Baltimore after which, the, the Which is surprising me 240 wasn't a win for you just because Baltimore's times aren't like you don't it doesn't have a prize purse you're not getting a the 220 guys you're not even get getting I mean you would be the 230 guy. Yeah, so that year I think someone won in 231 and then second place was like 235. So I mean, going into that race, winning wasn't even on my radar. I think I think my goal was two fifty for that race, and I obviously exceeded that. So each time I was blast for that year, the two marathons, I really blasted my goals out of the water, and I think that challenged me to think a lot bigger going forward. Yeah. What were you doing? So after you ran the three hours, and then you go and do Baltimore at two forty. What did did you change about your training? Anything? So I. Went from that like 40 mile per week training and I upped it to, I think I ended up averaging 70 or 75 miles a week and I was doing more structured training with actual, you know, hard workouts, yeah. Yeah. which made a big difference in, in long runs. So I was following at the time uh, this book, Advanced Marathoning, that Peter yep. Fitzinger wrote. And that's, I mean, I don't think there's any magic to that book. I think it's just, it has structure. You hit, you know, lots of threshold tempos you hit lots of interval workouts you hit progressive long runs and just the the consistency and structure along with upping my mileage you know nearly 100 percent from the last cycle uh led to some big gains yeah what i think is interesting about that is i'm, I'm sitting across two people that i think operate in a similar way like i'm kind of more a poet when it comes to running which means i just follow whatever <laughs> wind is blowing but both you and megan are students of, of running and have taken the time to figure out how to run from the knowledge that's out there without a coach, without somebody telling you how to do it. Now, I know you're with a coach now, yeah. but up until this, you've been pretty much self-coached. Like, what's your fastest marathon self-coached? Uh, so this is the first training cycle I've been coached. So it would be 222 last year in, in uh, Toledo. Okay. And so you got to 222 by yourself, and uh, Megan's at 252 by by yourself so far what made you made the switch yeah it was a few things I think I was obviously I in my mind starting to plateau a bit and that's just the nature of getting faster I mean there's going to be diminishing returns but I also felt that the stress of trying to come up with training plans and worrying like am I doing things optimally if I if I could just find someone who's an expert that I could trust with that I, I think it that alleviated a lot of the stress of training. You know, here's your your workouts. I mean, obviously, there's some back and forth discussing planning and stuff. It's not just yeah boilerplate, but it's you know it's it's much less stressful just to have. Here's your week. You know, it's easy to just do what's written down. But basically. I see both of you as people that I think when you're as smart as both of you are, you tend to think you're smarter than other people. That like I can if they could figure it out, I could figure it out. How do you get to the place where you're like, I'm going to trust somebody with that? Is, does that make sense what I'm saying? Not saying that you're arrogant or anything, but you're like, I can read the books. I can study the training stuff. Like, how do you, how did you decide and choose someone that you could put your trust in? Because I mean, when you spend this much time training and you're doing hundred mile weeks, that's a lot of your time. That's a huge investment. So if it's not working and it goes sideways, that's an opportunity lost. Yeah. I think uh, for me, it was sort of a battle between my pride and uh, whatever other side of me there is, I guess. <laughs> but uh, as basically, I wanted to achieve these big goals in the marathon and other distances, but I wanted it to be done on my own. I was like, I'm writing the training. I'm doing it all. It's, it's a total effort by me doing this. But it's like, why why is that so important to me? I think it's just purely pride. So I... I let go of that and I started working with this coach who in my mind is a, a far greater expert you know has been coaching for 20 plus years what's the name of your coach 
Greg Weich. So he coaches in Boulder. So he's coached uh, the Broomfield High School out there. He's coached some very legit athletes. Uh, Brent Vaughn, who ran for Bowerman Track Club. He coaches uh, my friend Ethan here in the city, who's a very fast uh, XD1 athlete as well. Ethan's so, new to the city, right? Uh, within the past few years, yeah. Okay. So a couple, you know, very talented athletes, and he's done some some great things with them. So I wanted to give it a shot, and I didn't really have any other coaches that I knew of or would trust potentially. So it just kind of fell into place. Yeah. How did yeah How did you guys get connected? Uh, just via Ethan, okay. who's one of my main training yeah. partners here in Baltimore. Yeah. And you just immediately felt like you could trust this guy. Yeah, I mean, there were some difficulties. I think in the first couple months especially trying to like learn what works best for me I think on his side Mm -hmm. what what sort of middle ground we needed to come to for training I I think there was some little talking on each side and just figuring it out over a process like for a bit there I think we were both kind of unsatisfied with the other side but we, <laughs> we figured it out eventually and i think as we went on it it improved dramatically yeah I and mean, that's interesting because it is it, it coach is someone that you have to put full trust in and they have to also understand you as a person so there's a learning curve it it's interesting to me that you know when it got rough that, that you, neither one of you guys bailed like you you were able to stick with it what made you decide to stick with it yeah, I think I, I had mentally committed to I'm going to do this whole training cycle under his program. There's no point, you know, doing just a little bit and then stopping. You know, I'd, I'd rather see it through and see what happens. And I think that was that was definitely worth it. I learned a lot in this past cycle that I really hadn't done, uh, really hadn't been exposed to in terms of new training styles and different focuses that I think now I I appreciate how important they are. So I think there was a lot learned and I'm glad I gave it that chance, obviously. Yeah. Have you switched up anything as far as nutrition goes? Uh, Like day to day nutrition, not dramatically. I would say like I still probably eat pretty unhealthy in terms of my snacking, like just eat whatever, but I try to, you know, get my macro nutrients. I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and, Usually when I'm cooking, I'm cooking like a fried rice with, you know, a ton of vegetables in it or uh, a curry. So it's generally pretty healthy when I'm cooking. It's just more the snacking and ice cream and other <laughs> binging. that. When you're running 100-mile weeks, I feel like it's okay. You need yeah. the carbs, I mean, I right? feel like ice cream is essential. So. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think mentally for I've sure. I've cut it out right now for the last week. And I tell you what, I'm a sadder human. <laughs> <laughs> One week, I'm that's not, yeah, it. It's, 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 I don't know. Um, so you go through this whole training block with a coach for the first time and you're at the starting line of Houston. Is this like the most confident you've been or how, are, how does it compare to other cycles where you coach yourself? I wouldn't say it's the most confident I've ever been just because I think the goal that first was, marathon, he was the most confident. Yeah, very confident <laughs> that one for sure. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I think it's just because the goal I had set for myself to run, you know, 217, 59 mm-hmm. or better basically to hit the, the trials mark was an intimidating goal. So I wouldn't say I was the most confident. I thought it was possible. I thought that I was certainly in the best shape I'd ever been. So that's about as good as it gets. I, I, mean, can, so. I personally can't wait because I'm going to celebrate the hell out of your 217 or 216, whatever you do. Uh, when you hit that number, because I know you're going to, I it for me it's not – whether or not you hit that number, I know, I'm, I'm looking at you right now, I know you're going to hit that number. I know you're going to go OTQ. I have no doubt in my mind. I, just the type of person you are, you're a freight train. Like, I know that sooner or later, you're going to make it happen. Yeah. Unless you're telling me right now that you're retiring. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, nothing is, you know, guaranteed in life or sports. So, yeah, I will, you know, obviously that's, that's my big goal for the year. I mean, hopefully this year or next year, if I, if I have to, but that will be the, the goal I work towards. And I, I want to the goal. It's, it's a full effort for sure. Yeah. I definitely want to get more back into Houston and kind of talk about the day. Yep. But before we go there, you just mentioned you, next year, is there something on your radar that looks like a promising race coming up for you? Not really i haven't really decided yet i've you know there's some races that look interesting in the spring but 
whether I do a marathon or not. I mean, I'm signed up for Boston, but I'm probably just going to do it as a training run or a fun run. Yeah, there's going to be a lot, friends. Of, a lot of us out there. I'll be spectating. That'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> If but, you need uh, me to hold your bag or yeah, yeah, you know. love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's there's nothing that's really in terms of a marathon jumped out to me. I mean, I'm still in the the week post race. I'm giving myself a little time for reflection and just letting something excite me before I decide anything firmly. But I think certainly in the fall, I'll, I'll definitely run a marathon. I'm not sure which one. I mean, Indianapolis is a good option. CIM as well. You know, Ch- you've Chicago. already done CIM though. I have done CIM, yeah. In and Indianapolis, you've never done. I've never done Indy. Megan really liked it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push for Indy. Yeah, and my friend who ran the trials mark there last, I guess, trials window said they give you a thousand dollars if you hit it there, oh, which is pretty awesome. Nice. So, so you're definitely going to Indy. Right. We just confirmed it's it. It's a contender. <laughs> it's a contender. And there's also, you know, maybe go to Europe, run like Valencia. That would be a cool one. That yeah. is cool. So also a cool color. Yeah, so there's there's lots of options. I feel like in the fall and in the spring, there, I guess there are options, but nothing's really felt as compelling. Maybe it's just because I I just ran a just marathon ran, this yeah. past yeah, week. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, l- let's go back yeah. to there because neither one of us have run Houston. It's supposed to be a spectacular marathon, uh, really nice course. Let's just walk through the day. Like, how far was your hotel from the uh, course? Like, when did you fly in? Yeah, I flew in Friday. Uh, uh, afternoon, so two days before. I think that's pretty essential when you're going for like a marathon or something for optimal performance. I've done the day before, but I, I just feel like a little of that travel stress clings to you in some way. So I get there and I'm with my girlfriend and we're staying in an Airbnb, which is really cool. 75 and sunny, which is beautiful, but obviously not ideal racing weather. But I obviously I had looked at the forecast and saw it was going to drop. drop significantly, which is pretty incredible it ended up working out great because i think it was saturday like it was it was like 40 or 50 but there were these 50 mile an hour gusts that must have been really nerve-wracking it was i think maybe some of the strongest winds i've just like been outside in because it was like you literally i was going for a jog the day before the race to the convention to pick up my bib and all that and i was moving in place like when it gusted i was physically not moving forward i was like if this is like this tomorrow like there's no, you can't even finish a marathon. Like it's going to be crazy. <laughs> yeah. So luckily, I mean, it all worked out great. There were, you know, 10 or 15 mile an hour winds and it was in the thirties, which is pretty close to perfect, honestly. So no complaints. I actually, you know. my best marathons have been as you get closer to 30. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do better. I, I definitely like those cold temperatures. Yeah. So you get your bib. So I, this is a little extra excitement. Oh. I check my bib number like, wait a second, this says half marathon. Uh-oh. That's not good. <laughs> so I call them. They're like, okay, come to the expo and we'll sort it out. So, okay. I have like my email receipts ready to show like oh. sign. I'm in the marathon. Okay. Like here's a screenshot. Like here's this specifically. That's says just you were in the marathon, Like from like August when I had switched into it because I had originally signed up for the half Okay, and then switched to the full. So that's, they're that's like, yeah, it, it shows you December 16th switching to the half. I was like, nope. Didn't do that. Uh, so anyway, they were very nice. They switched it easily. It was all, you know. Just Could have been a totally different story. Yeah. So but that was mentally, does that like like shake you at all? Are you like, maybe this isn't meant to be? I'm not even signed up for the right thing? I don't think it, it shook me. Okay. I, was, I mean, I was a little worried that they wouldn't change it, which I think in retrospect is silly. Like it was. Their mistake. It was good that they yeah. fixed it. No problem there whatsoever. I would have panicked. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I, I didn't panic, but I was a little, you know, stressed and yeah. All right, so you, there. you get the you get the right bib, get the right bib, yep. And then so it's the morning of, it's thirty degrees. Wait, you're gonna skip the pre pre dinner? Yeah, so I oh, this is actually yeah. a big thing for me. I've been struggling with like all these stomach issues a lot over the past year for like workouts and racing in the morning, especially. I think I haven't gone to a doctor, but it's self-diagnosed as GERD. Just like I get these like intense acid reflux bouts and it seems to be linked to like eating either late at night or eating specific foods. So at the half marathon tune up that hit me really bad. Like I felt the morning of the race, I felt all like nauseous essentially. And like, oh, wow. I, I run the half marathon, like just feeling right in this like tiny zone where if I went a little harder, I was going to puke. And if I went 
a little slower I was going to be going slow. so it's just like really fine line where I felt awful and I couldn't eat basically for the rest of the day after this race I felt so bad like so this was a huge like focus just wanted to avoid feeling like that in this race so I was very regimented the day of I got like a super plain bowl of rice chicken and a couple of veggies ate it at like 4 p.m you know it's like oh, wow <laughs> yeah no, no chances being taken I was like not going out with my friends who are going to get like burgers, you know, like mm-hmm. six pounds. No way I'm doing that. I'm eating this super boring meal and I'm staying in and I'm watching Kipchoge, the last milestone yeah. nice. for inspiration. So that was great. And I, yeah, I set my alarm for three thirty. get up. I eat a banana dipped in peanut butter for breakfast. And then, yeah, around six twenty, I was in a hotel. That's it for carbs. That was it. Yeah. yeah in the morning. Wow. Of, no bagel, no nothing. For me, that I just wanted to be really careful okay. because I've had so many issues, and I know that that has worked in the past. Did, so. you, dr- did you drink carbs? Like, did you have a like? I drink. Yeah, I had like a, a gel actually pre race by about an hour, so there's a little bonus gel in there. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not drinking any like Scratch Labs, just like water, yeah, water, just okay. a little water. Yeah, mm, it kind of makes it even more impressive. Oh, and a little mm. beet juice actually about three hours before as well do you think that works debatable i don't think the morning of it matters that much i think you should do it like the week before i think taking it daily and yeah is more important than spending a hundred dollars a week on beet juice yeah exactly (laughs) well you you can get the powder and it's a little cheaper but yeah it's it's my one you know expense little expense (laughs) nutritionally yeah so yeah i get over to the race i'm in a hotel like two blocks from the start which is incredible So I get there at like 6.20, you get to the it's the American Development Program Corral. They have porta-potties in there, which is amazing. And I jog back and forth on this one block corral for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and there's a lot of talent there. And I'm guessing you're seeing some some of the other athletes, some of the well-known athletes. Are you starstruck or, or like impressed by anything that you're seeing? So it was actually separate from the elite crowd. They were in the next block over. I was like, oh, can we go warm up in this? It's like a nice three block stretch in front of the start. They're like, no, that's for elites. I'm like, okay, well, jog back and <laughs> forth back. on this one block <laughs> stretch. So I do that, and then it's pretty cold and windy. So I brought like, you know, these old sweatpants and a, I'm forgetting, I have like a jacket or something that were in my basically goodwill pile and they do the thing where you know they donate the clothes people throw away so it's like okay i'll bring these for the race specifically so i'm wearing those until about you know 10 minutes before uh degown and go they open up the corral to the start line and suddenly everyone in the the adp is like sprinting up to try and get as far like up to the start line as possible it's like kind of a mad rush how Mm. many people are in the corral uh a couple hundred people wow what's the qualifying time for that I think it's for the marathon. I know men's is like two thirty-five. I'm not exactly uh, sure what the women, but okay. it's it's a combined start with the half as well. Okay. So it's it's everyone mixed in there. So uh, eventually, I get like I'm probably eight to ten rows of people back from the start. So okay. not too bad. That was a weird thing about watching it for me was that there were the half marathon start yeah. at the same time. So when you yeah. see Kira finishing and she's finishing at two nineteen, and you see the half people on the other side of the wall. Finishing. And they didn't look like, you know, it, it like when they're running down the chute, I guess people sprint at the end. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's people coming A two-hour half they're is still respectable. Running two hours. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's not walking. Yeah, but that's, compared that's to Kira doing a 5'10", yeah. you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. So do you t- you start at the same time as the elites? They're yeah, just... It's, just, it's just one yeah. start. So I think I was probably two or three seconds back, you okay. know, elapsed versus clock time or whatever, but... So you yeah. go out and and how are you feeling? How, are the go miles out, clicking away? Or? Feels, yeah, feels great. First miles of five fifteen, which is exactly the pace I need to run. It was kind of with a little extra weaving. I I got right up behind this big pack of like the elite women there. It was like Sarah Hall and many others and a bunch of just guys as well. So it was this massive pack. It was like great, easy drafting. Can you incredible. feed off the energy in that? Oh yeah, yeah. It was the energy was really high especially until the half split off like i it was a bummer when they split off because it was great having mm-hmm. so many people that around people, yeah so i i was with them for two or three miles and i'm like hitting some 512s or five tests like oh there's a little too quick let me back off 
So I back off. I find the next sort of pack and Me- meanwhile, draft off of them. Meanwhile, <laughs> the, the Faster Bastards, Chatty Bastards on Facebook was going nuts with your splits and stuff. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was probably where 515. He's average at 515. Yeah. Hey. So I, yeah, I, I link up with another big pack and I find some guys who are going for the standard at that point. They're like, okay, 515s. They say that, but then we're hitting like, Hit like a 508 in there. We hit like a 5. I was like, this is a little quick, but it's kind of my only option at this point. <laughs> is it also once the, with, uh, the with a little bit of wind? Off. Like, was so, it nice to be in a pack of guys? It's hard. I mean, there was definitely wind, but I think we were mostly either getting hit in the side or with it a little bit in the first 10K okay. especially. But then I had sort of done the, looking at the course, looking at the wind direction, I would seen, okay, like 9 to 18 is basically going directly into the headwind. So that's mm. going to be the pivotal part. Like, I absolutely must be, like, with a group. That's the most essential thing. So I was like, got to stick with this group when the half split especially. So I, I clung on. It was probably 15 guys at this point, just oh, wow. clicking off, like, five twelves basically. So I was, mm. it's a little quick. And I was like, I wish, wish they were just going three seconds slower, but there's no one really behind us. So what choice do I have? So I, I stuck with them, and yeah, we start getting a little wind, especially like closer to the half marathon mark, and then we hit that one big bridge at like mile fourteen. It's like a maybe a forty or fifty foot hill, which is as big as it gets in this race, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> but I I sort of got gapped a little bit over the couple miles before that, and I was maybe twenty to thirty feet back after this bridge, and I was getting blasted by wind, especially on the top. Mm. And then things things got real there, I would say. It felt really easy until nearly the half marathon mark, and then things suddenly got pretty tough. How do you get out of that? Yeah, that's early to feel rough. Yeah, and especially like pre-race, I was like, I need it. If I want any chance of hitting this time, I need it to feel smooth until 18 because you get that tailwind, you can do anything, you know. But feeling it 13, 14, 15 starting to get tough was a bit too early and I was definitely mentally not in a, a great spot as I hit my first, you know, I was hitting, you know, five twelve, five thirteen until that point. I think the half marathon was one oh eight thirty nine, which is like five thirteen, fourteen pace. Yeah. So then suddenly I hit like, you know, a five eighteen, a five twenty five, like a five twenty eight, and it's like, oh well my my left leg in particular is not feeling great, especially in the quad area. There's there's a long way to go, and I'm getting blasted by wind. Watching the pack, you know, sail off into the distance. That's uh, nothing I can do about it. You know, <laughs> literally nothing. So, I mean, how do you pull yourself out of that? Like, did you just wait for that to end, or do you have like a way a mantra or something, or like what do you do? Yeah, I mean, normally I have, I feel like some some mental tools. That's why I really. Like the night before a race, I really like to look through my entire training log before I look at all the hard workouts. Like, look how, look how much work and effort you've devoted to this over the past four or five months. Like, and I think that instills sort of this deep uh, unwillingness to to give in when you just spend that much time and effort and really focus on how much you've put into this. So I think that was a factor. I I was I was considering dropping out. I was like, well, wow. I'm definitely not going to run. 217 now like even though elapsed pace wise i was still 515 or under even after a couple of slower miles but just the trajectory of those yeah, miles mile 15, and how i felt you know 10 miles can be a long yeah, way <laughs> yeah so i think it was you know i switched my watch to that overall pace and time and said like you know 15 something miles 515 i was like what am i doing here like i'm thinking about quitting i've never run a race anywhere close to this fast with the 222 you know even if I'm slowing down, I'm still, you know, in that neighborhood or better. And I really like mentally, I think it was just like, you can't drop out of a race when you're still doing better than you've ever done just because it hurts a lot. Like that's not a good reason to drop out. You need to just suck it up and deal. Like a marathon's always going to get to that point at some level. Well, see, that's uh, a funny thing. It was thing a bit that... earlier than I hoped, but yeah. it was always going to feel like that at some point. That's the funny thing about you, though, is knowing you, I would never like you almost seem robotic <laughs> in your in your running. And I, I would have thought Jeremy just locks in. He's done the work. And I feel like that guy just powers through. Like even when we see you like you, like in Baltimore, you've dominated, you've been out in front and just just crush. And it looks like you're having fun doing it. 
So to hear that you go through that is, I, I feel bad for you, but it's good, it's good for me to know that like, okay, this guy, cause I, I look up to the way that you run race and, and just the way that you dominate. And so to know that like you're sitting there having those thoughts that I think all of us have is, is something I wouldn't have expected to hear from you. Yeah. I think this marathon and there's probably been a few others where the, the thought, this is my last marathon. I'm never doing one again, <laughs> flashes through, but then a minute later, you're like, you're just saying that, like, you know, after this, you're going to run another one. So just shut up and <laughs> deal with it. So I think that was just those mental battles from really 14 or 15 to mile 18 were probably, I mean, mentally the toughest part of the race. I think physically it, it did get tougher, but I think I was in just such a better headspace late in the race that it didn't feel as tough. So did you sort of like chunk it up to where, especially when you're feeling bad at 14, 15, like just get to 18 and yeah. then, you know, that was exactly it. it was okay. Just get to 18. Yeah. If you get there and you still feel like dropping out, you can do it, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, just make it there, like, and then things will get better and feel it out. So I did that, and I just, you know, struggled, ran some high 520s through that stretch, right into the headwind. It was, just felt brutal. But eventually, you know, make it there. You turn back towards downtown Houston. You're heading in the right direction, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. uh, got a little tailwind. Stop feeling that blast to the face. I don't know if it was a direct tailwind, but at least no longer a direct headwind. So that was nice. And the sun just seemed to shine a little bit brighter, you know. <laughs> birds Things, came out. Yeah, the birds started <laughs> chirping. Uh, the built-in speakers they have along the road randomly started playing music. In the Did stretch. you know that you would be seeing Anne soon? Uh, she was actually out at mile 7 and 10. So Okay, so you, that was over. So not until the finish, yeah. Okay. No, no boosts out there. And this is, I think, from about... 12 or 13 to maybe 22 is probably the most isolated portion of the race, of even the 23, 24, just because it's so far to the west of downtown. There's really no one out there, and you're basically running along this highway like out there. And you're by yourself at this for a big part of it? For most of it. There were a couple people that passed me in this time, like a couple guys flew by. Uh, yeah, pretty much that was it, though. Yeah. I mean, when they passed me, I tried to like cling on for mm -hmm. as much as I could. I think maybe half a mile for one person at one point, but it was, yeah, it was something to at least break it up a bit. Just people passing by. Strategy wise, when you say people were passing you, you pretty much went out at the pace that you wanted to go for the whole run, pretty much, right? Were you trying to be around five fifteen the whole time? Five fifteen was the goal, and yeah, I'd gone a little bit faster for the first half. Yeah. Okay, so. Do you feel like you are the type of runner that goes out and it's one pace or do you feel like like you're not the one who's going to go out and run six to start and then drop down to, you know, low fives as you as you uh, do a negative split towards the finish? Yeah, that's not usually my style. I mean, actually, in Toledo last year, I negative split about a minute, which was about as good as I've ever done. I think it was just because it was more of a tactical race, but I. I really like to run that even or even a slight positive split, I think, is suits me well sometimes. I mean, I would love to run a negative split. <laughs> that Toledo one was crazy. Being... I remember, and that you just, I forgot that I watched it on TV <laughs> and you could see like you were about 100 yards off first place. You were real close at one point. And then it was just like, I was like, is he going to pass? Is he not going to pass? Is he going to go? And I don't know why, but it, you end up on TV quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it, uh, yeah, just these local streams or TV coverage of races, yeah. So now that you get this tailwind around mile 18 and everything seems a little better and easier, is there ever a thought that you can still do this OTQ or is that totally out of your mind? No, I think that's that's well gone by then. I had been running just 10 or 15 seconds too slow for those miles and I knew just with how my legs were feeling, they're wasn't going to be any making that up at this point. So that, that was gone. And I think I was just, I was doing this mental math. It's like, okay, five, if I can hold five thirties, that's what, like a one twelve half marathon, one twelve plus one Oh eight. Okay. That puts me at two twenty one ish or two twenty high. If I can just not really completely blow up here and just hold that like 15 seconds slower pace for the rest of the way. I was like, okay, like just focus on that, like hit as many miles at that pace as you can. Like, and I even 
started clipping off a couple like 525s, whether that was the, the tailwind or just feeling a little bit better. I don't know, but settled into a good rhythm between like 525 to 530 where things felt tolerable and that I could probably survive to the finish if I just held that. And then, yeah, there was the extra excitement of Kira D'Amato. Yeah. It was like in my head. So something I considered, I was like, if I wasn't going for the OTQ or if the OTQ was slower, I would totally be awesome to run like pace near somewhere. her pacers. Or, yeah. You know, it'd just be a, yeah. you know, they're going to run a, a great paced race. It'd be fun to be there just to watch it. But we well, get the motorcycle. Yeah. So there get... was, there was a pickup truck. I was like, okay, so 219.40. I'm at like mile 19 here. I'm doing, you know, 530. She's probably going to pass me in the next like three miles. So yeah, sure enough, like the pickup truck pulls up alongside me a mile or two later. And then I look back, I see her and her pacers. It's mm. like, okay, cool. Like this is awesome to see, like just to, just to be here. It's and everybody's going nuts. Cause they're like, I see again on TV, Jeremy's on TV, <laughs> yeah. you know, running next to Kira D'Amato. Yeah. So they pull up alongside me. I'm like, well, I might as well try and stay with them as long as I can. So it's maybe half a mile of intense pain trying to keep up their pay because they were flying the last so you're days. non-verbal at this point yeah i was I, <laughs> someone showed me a screenshot it's pretty funny you know like kira's cruising she looks like very smooth with her pacer it's just me with a huge grimace like <laughs> teeth bared yeah. just like yeah i'm completely out in the pain zone there so i just try and hang out to them for a few minutes and one one of these other runners who was running near them ended up running right in front of me so we sort of yo-yoed back and forth for a couple miles and that was good distraction welcome distraction and eventually just went on and i saw her disappear out of sight eventually mm. so so it was good and then that last stretch there's a little underpasses there's like two or three where you like go down this 20 foot hill and up so it's kind of reversed uh, which is interesting i actually liked it though i think like really? you get a little momentum going down first and they were small yeah. enough hills where like aerobically it didn't feel that bad okay. and i think it was just my legs were in such bad shape but aerobically i felt actually okay which is i think why i was able to settle into that pace just a bit slower so they were actually a nice little breakup i thought like just mix it up from the the pancake flat course yeah see and this is where i'm wondering if those extra carbs would help <laughs> out the legs <laughs> well i mean i was eating gels i know race as well yeah um okay so when did you know you were going to PR? I don't think I was 100% sure it was happening, but I mean, I was pretty confident mile 22 or 23. Okay. You're doing like the weird, your brain's trying to do all math. messed up. <laughs> it's in pain. You're like, uh, okay, so this pace is, you know, just doing this weird math where it's very approximate. I was like, I think I'm going to run like a 220 or a 221 still. Yeah, so the I, only thing good about that is you're distracting yourself. It takes yeah. like a mile to figure out the math. Yeah. Like, oh, oh yeah. it takes a really long time. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, I'm finished. Yeah, yeah <laughs> never mind. Yeah, so the miles were really, yeah, taking a while. They have a every basically every kilometer and every mile. So it's like, oh, another kilometer takes forever. Just, yeah, really uh, time was very slow in that stretch. Yeah. But then finally, yeah, making it to like 40K or so, you know, there's just 2K left and basically a straightaway and you have the half marathoners on the other side of the road there so it's a little distraction and there's a lot more people those last two or three miles cheering so that was that was nice and i was just like right in this sweet spot where i could feel my left quad like borderline cramping locking mm. up ways like you're doing I, the little prayers it was like if i try and push the pace mm -hmm. a little more i'm probably gonna just like collapse so i just need to stay right in the spot where it'll function <laughs> so just staying right in that that sweet spot and was able to make it to the finish line and just sort of staggered uh, to the railing there and saw Kira celebrating, which is cool. And is you know, cool. her family. So that was fun. And then just sort of limped around and walked through the, the shoot and all that. And yeah. Finished up. So your immediate thoughts were you, I know your angle was obviously the OTQ, but this was still a PR and a great race. So were you content, happy, disappointed? Like what were you feeling immediately after? Yeah, I actually had this like, not a moment of clarity, but I felt very content. It's like, hey, like it didn't happen today. Like that was my goal and I was going to go for it. Maybe if I'd gone slower I, through the first half by a minute or something, I ended up running 219 or 218 high if I have a good race but then I'd be sitting here wondering you know what if mm -hmm. so I had no regrets I mean I think that was the plan and I had gone through this whole mental debate prior to the race it's like hey if I have a bad race I blow up and run 
220 something it's okay like i'm here to try and run the trials qualifier i'm not here to i mean prs are great but that's not the main goal it's yeah. going for this mark so to get a pr was a great consolation prize and i yeah i felt very satisfied i mean i had that mental battle in my mind i overcame it i endured a lot of pain those last 10 miles and made it with the new pr so i was very happy yeah yeah that's super impressive now normally when we have a guest on the podcast First off, we're asking what shoe they're wearing, but I know that you're wearing teal alpha flies. Yep. Because I saw a one picture that Ann took over <laughs> your footage, the only thing on the, in the picture. <laughs> and then also, uh, typically we ask, you know, what what's something that you would celebrate with after the marathon? So what what would be your post run beverage and meal? Oof, that's that's a tough one. I mean. If it was in Baltimore, you know, there's a couple of restaurants I, I truly love, you know, like an Eki Ben rice bowl would really hit the spot. But I mean, just any. So you're going can, for more carbs. I feel like most people are like, I want a juicy burger or like. I could, I'll eat anything. Okay. Honestly. I, I no think it's particular. For me, it's more salt than anything. I yeah. want like a big pile of salt. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I, I went to a Mexican restaurant and I was like. Let me oh, get that's the, right. You got Bud Lights. Let right? me get the Plato Grande, which is just like one of everything. It's like this family <laughs> run place. It was really nice, like this this really sweet family, and they're like so. No concerns about the stomach at this point. My stomach felt real bad after eating this, okay. but I didn't care. Yeah, yeah. I was like, give me the refried beans, give yeah. me like everything. And yeah, they're handing us little Bud Lights because like that's just what they do there. They just give you buckets of Bud Light for free wow. at this restaurant. So that was fun. And then uh, I was with like a group of friends who also ran the half or full so it was like 10 or 15 of us and we wow we ate there and we went to a brewery later in the night and got some pizza and just sort of chilled so it's good day yeah yeah that sounds like a perfect day you get a yeah. pr then you go out and have fun i mean i was pretty exhausted but yeah. you know, it was still fun to, yeah i feel like sometimes so, yeah. though you can't even enjoy the post-race celebration because you're you. that beat up <laughs> that's megan all the time like we when we were in california we did a race and afterwards uh, we were going to go get uh, food and stuff. Megan was just curled up. In that was a 50-miler. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, 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 that's fair. That yeah. just sucks. Yeah, Marathons, the, though. Yeah. They can go either way afterwards. Yeah. yeah, and I think between maybe those few drinks and some yeah. food and 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol, I was feeling <laughs> pretty good. I was walking pretty normally. Like, I didn't – I don't think I, like, so had the quad that. wasn't bothering you? I mean, I didn't feel great, but, yeah, it wasn't anything brutal. So like, I wasn't maybe limping just downstairs dehydration a little bit cramping you up? I don't know. I mean, it's probably just going at a pace that my legs weren't prepared for. You know, it's right. just, yeah, I don't know exactly what it was. So but. what is, what does recovery look like for you now? Like, are you not going to run for a while? Are you doing other things? What it, What are you doing? Yeah. So normally I'm one of those people, you know, not that I run every day, but pretty much run every day. <laughs> <laughs> like the day after a marathon, I'd be forcing, you know, a two or three mile little jog and oh, wow. running every day, which I do think in some respects can be helpful like for loosens blood flow. Up, yeah. Yeah. Loosen you up. But this Clear time I, I think mentally, I just mentally and physically, I was like, just need a little reset, especially after that race, just whatever I want to do this week I'll do. So, so far I haven't run and it's Thursday today. I had gotten the bike for an hour yesterday. That was the first real exercise I've gotten. Uh, I chased after the white rail, <laughs> to get back home from work so i ran maybe five blocks yesterday so okay. I, was, I was running pretty quick i felt okay so that's that's good <laughs> but uh yeah i'll just be taking it probably pretty easy until this weekend and then just work back up and start running again this weekend and next week and hopefully get back to training within two or three weeks yeah all right one last question for me so You've obviously cleared through different goals. So you probably set one to run sub three and then it was to run sub, you know, 250 there. I don't know what your goals are, but clearly you've hit different goals and you've had breakthroughs. How difficult and how much like, can you kind of describe like what you need to do to get to that next level? What you need to do to break through something that seems like when you plateau, how did, how'd you get past it? You're saying in previous mm -hmm. goals, uh, for the first few major breakthroughs, it was very simple. It was increase mileage and be consistent and run workouts. Like, you know, I went from like 40 miles to 75 miles, to like 85 to 90 miles, then 
once like I was doing like 110, 115 a week and then sort of found my <laughs> during COVID found, 100 every week, found my limit there. You know, it's like, all right, that's a bit too much. Now it's all about, you know, refining the, the workouts and to hitting different systems. So I, I think it's changed a little for a while. It was a, a very simple formula more, more is better and then I, I found, I think the ceiling of that where I was going to get with that. So now it's a, uh, just changing uh, the specifics. And I think that's where the, the coaching has come in a bit. Yeah. So right now, obviously you still have the desire. Well, I'm guessing you still have the desire to get that OTQ. Sure. Yeah. Do you like, what are you doing mentally or what will you switch up or will you just maintain what you're doing now and just reload? Like what's the plan? Yeah. So there's not a complete plan, but I think, from this past cycle, there are a lot of things I really liked that I thought got me aerobically in the best shape I've been. So a lot of like short repeats at 5K pace as like B workouts mixed in to marathon training, which I usually do some of, but this was like a, a much bigger emphasis, this cycle. And then we were doing like a lot of, you know, like medium long tempos. But I think the one thing for next cycle will be adding in more long run workouts, which is something I've done in past cycles, which is, you know, hitting those long marathon pace blocks, those threshold blocks, mid long run, early long run, late long run, which I think just gets your legs in a place where they can, they toughen up quite a bit and you can really battle like say in the marathon where I start, my pace started to slip a bit just to move into that next gear and keep the pace to me that, mentally at least felt like what I was missing this cycle. So I think that'll be an emphasis to include that with a lot of the good things that I've had with this. And I think just another train training cycle will just continue to progress me and adding in a couple things I felt were lacking will get me more ready. Yeah. All right. You've been, yeah, you've been really consistent, I would say for the pet. Like, have you had an injury? Cause it sounded like in He's college injuries, you yeah. suffered through several injuries and it was like overuse, but you can handle what seems like a lot of mileage now. Yeah. So I've, I've just had like inflammatory issues, nothing breaking, which I think is the difference. So I've had like it band syndrome, which I think at one point kept me out for like a month of not like completely out for a month, but not a lot of running and bad pain. And I've had various, like, you know, just little tendonitis and Flare ups, but fortunately, it seems like physical therapy and corrective exercises have fixed that and prevented it from derailing training for an extended period of time. So there's been a few, but nothing major, I would say. A any advice that you'd have for your local runners here in Baltimore if they want to PR or do better in the marathon? Yeah, I think everything just boils down for most people to consistency. I know that's like a very cliche answer. <laughs> it's an extremely cliche answer, but it's just like making the training a high enough priority that you won't skip sessions or you'll take it seriously. You'll make sacrifice. Not that you need to sacrifice everything, but maybe there's a night out at the bar before a workout, an important workout or something, you know, and you don't drink or maybe you don't even go, you stay in, go to bed early. Like, I know that's not a, very fun answer, but sometimes <laughs> you need to make those tough choices and it'll benefit your training quite a bit just to, to shift your priorities around. I mean, running isn't going to be the top priority for most people and it's not the top priority for me either, but it's one of the top few. So I, I just treat it that way and have to shift things around and get creative sometimes, with, you know, like run commuting and things like that, time savers. So I, I think it's all about just yeah, prioritization and making sure you get get your training done consistently. Yeah. All right. Well, we really appreciate your time. Yeah. And thanks if for anybody, coming in. Thanks for anybody wants me. to follow your training, they can. You're you're public on Strava, yeah, and you Strava. can check it out. So it's Jeremy Ardenoy. Uh, I I don't know that he's gotten. He's probably got a local legend on everything in Baltimore. So <laughs> just look for local legends. You'll find him. No, uh, the crowns. Yeah, but what's the easiest way to find you on Strava? Just to search Jeremy Ardenoy. Yeah, just search by All name. Right. Yeah. All right, cool. Maybe we'll put the link in the um, description notes. But that's awesome. It's always fun catching up, and we're hella proud of you. So appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah.